Hey everybody, it's Tyler here at Chessy Chance checking in with Kerry Division winners, 148 Robo Wranglers, an absolutely phenomenal season. Really, I think a great testament of a team that's just kept improving, improving, and getting better throughout the entire season. Here, of course, we'll be going through their incredible robot. I love the overall packaging that 148 brings. I'll be talking about some cool things to do with their sword drive and belly pan, and of course, going into uh, their cascading area and their intake as well. I can't wait to talk about these Kerry Division winners coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun was brought to you by viewers like you and also by the following. Discover how you can graduate debt-free at Kettering University with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more, schedule a visit, or apply. Fun is continuing to grow and looking for new ad partners for the 2024 season. If your organization has a positive message to spread to our over 250,000 unique viewers, go to firstupdatesnow.com slash contact to get more information. Jace, let's start talking about on your short drive. You've been doing a, a couple things I think are uh, beneficial to the first community to learn more about. So talking about like your encoders and anything else you're doing as well. Yes, so this season we decided that we wanted to go swerve immediately. Um, we actually saw the Kettering um, robot in three days and decided that the swerve was good for the platform. And so we decided to integrate the West Coast product Swerve X modules. So you can, as you can tell right here, they're inverted. Um, and so that allows for more bottom space to be taken up and allows for better space for up here for the uh, angler. And then over here, you have our absolute encoder right in here, which that allows for us to not have to reset the, um, the modules every time we go to the field, which is just an easier thing for the drive team. Um, and then next, we started the season off with a 6.0 to one uh, swerve, which we started to experience some, some burnout. Um, so we decided that for the less burnout and for more acceleration, we went to a six and a half to one to be a little bit faster and smoother um, in all of our movements. Um, so yeah, that's that's when all. Did you, when did you make those changes? Um, so we made those changes about two weeks into driving the robot, which would have been about week six of build. Okay, wow. So awesome, cool to hear on that. Uh, I'd love to let's see well, how teams are. You know, not just taking a cot swerve, right, but adding on to it mm -hmm. and, and making it their own as well too. I think it's awesome. So, uh, Aiden, talk to me about your uh, belly pan. Uh, a little bit more about uh, what's been constituted with it, and uh, anything that you want to talk more to the first community about. So, when we were uh, designing our bot, we went through a couple iterations of lifts, and we ended up going with the cascade lift. Uh, the cas cascade lift is really nice because you can go anywhere on the field, pick up any score anywhere, any object. Um, but one weakness with it is the center of gravity because, you know, you're going, your center of gravity is outside the parameters of the bot. And when we're designing our belly pan, we kind of fix that by adding slugs um, in between, kind of sandwich slugs in between. And that allowed us to uh, specifically put different amounts of weight uh, throughout the bot to kind of minimize the tipping and the uh, rocking of the bot whenever the lift is out. We also uh, put our battery right in the middle of the bot so we can kind of tip this over and very easy battery replacement. Now was that all from trial and error? Did you do some of that in design as well too that told you uh, how, how your CG should be? It was uh, more trial and error because you know we, we made our lift and it was tipping a lot so we saw that and we redesigned our belly pan to minimize it. Uh, Ian, you talked about the uh, cascade a little bit. Let's go through that a bit more and talk to me about uh, how the cascade works and let's demonstrate a little bit of uh, what's going on with it. Uh, it just looks so smooth on the field, so I'd love to hear more about it. Uh, thank you. So to first start off with the cascade, we're going to start with the pivot and how like it actually rotates. So going through like our you know design process for this design specifically with our archetype, we wanted to be extremely versatile. So we wanted to be able to pretty much score and intake from any position on the field. That would be accomplished through pretty much we have like three axes of motion so we can pivot up and down so we can do any height, any extension, and also like any angle. So that makes it where we can go at any angle of the field pretty much. So we first start off with our two falcons that run right here. A nice thing about our structure for the pivot is we connected these two shafts right here. So this is actually not one shaft, it's just connected right here. This makes it extremely easy to just like uh, take out these like plates that hold all the housing for the pivot gearing so instead of like having to feed this whole shaft out you know you can just disconnect the shaft take it out so we have all of our gearing for our staging like in these a-frame parts right here so this is it's like one or no it's one to 105 in terms of gearing so that's pretty much just you know 
extremely, extreme amount of torque, and that runs from our chain. And one really nice thing, if you can see right here, we have these little, these little kind of like um, gear parts that we're able to rotate down to tension the chain by pulling the plate downward. So that makes it extremely easy for us to tension this chain in case it becomes loose or anything like that. And then that goes on to like our main stage for our chain to the actual arm pivot. One really nice thing are these poly plates that we added on the sprocket. This made it really easy for us to not let the chain fall off. That happened once and the entire sprocket bent in half. So we fixed that. Then changing on, you can't, or you wanna come over here and look over here. This is where all of our cable feeds in. We have a really cool, interesting bearing block. You sadly cannot see it, but we have pretty much two bearings that rotate within each other that feed all the cables into this one point, which pretty much stop any kind of wearing or tearing on the wires as they feed through the entire cascade lift. Okay, so now on to the actual cascade lift. We went with like a belt design instead of chain because we felt that, and we actually tested too, that the belt design was a lot better in terms of cleanliness and just overall friction. So our cascade lift works with these blocks that we attached to the, yeah, right here, these blocks that we attach to these um, metal beams for actual cascades. So pretty much it works in kind of like a pulling, a pulling motion on the actual beams to pull the entire cascade up simultaneously and also bring it all back down at the same time. And also for our A-frame in terms of the pivot, we wanted to make sure in terms, since we would be extending so far out, we wanted to keep extremely low center of gravity. So that's how we decided to you know, make our whole design in terms of the cascade lift. For the A-frame uh, area you're looking at too, I mean, was that something initially you're like, hey, this is definitely the structure we want to go with, or did you play around with a couple different options for, especially for this type of uh, cascade that you're doing? So when during our, like, our um, initial brainstorming phase of our design. We didn't know exactly where we wanted to put this pivot, even if we would have a pivot. We might have first started out, or we did actually start first start out by having our pivot more to the side of the bot instead of the middle. But after realizing kind of our symmetrical mirror design where we can feed and intake on, the, on both sides of the robot, that's what made us end up putting our pivot in the middle of the bot, which resulted in like the most strategized and competitive design for our cascade lift. So that's our, our flip motion. So that is working our pivot right here. That is our high cone score. Now we have our mid cone score. Our, our oh, low cone score. Our uh, intake from the ground score. Then we, then we have our shelf cube. Our ground cube. And now our shelf cone. Yeah, just a super smooth motion that you're bringing there. And I, you know, watching it on the field uh, throughout this year as well, too. It, I, one of the things I just love is just seeing how more precise your team kept getting in over the year. You know, your first event, you know, definitely a little bit of improvement that you need to do. But by the time you got championships, it was awesome to see uh, where you guys well. Uh, let's start to wrap up. Uh, Michael, if we can talk about the uh, intake uh, as well and uh, talk to you more about uh, how this uh, overall structure came together. And, you know, we, like I said, we watched it on the field. It just looks so good. Of course. So the first thing we pinpointed early on in the season was that the intake would be one of the things we would iterate a ton. So our main concern with the intake was that it needed to be modular. So we have these two motors around down here. This is the wrist motor, and this is the like, actually powering motor. And as you can see, both of these shafts, uh, both of these uh, belts go up to this one shaft right here. And this one shaft, if we remove it, we can take the entire intake out and just interswap like another one on it. So following this structure, early on we had a, a very different like type of intake. Sure. We wanted to go for like a two-in-one design, just like one intake that can intake both uh, objects with no like different mechanisms. So it was more like a big like C shape like this. But we found out that while it was good for intaking uh, cubes, it wasn't so good for intaking cones. So we decided to take some inspiration from like other robots, more narrow like V type intakes. Sure. And so we moved on to uh, many different iterations, but we ultimately decided on one like this. So, can you pass me a cone real quick? We have these two rollers in the front, and these are meant to basically pinch the cone and pull it in. So, if I put it up here and just roll it a little. Yeah, it'll just pull it in and keep it closed. We run a feed forward loop on these motors to basically just like keep on pulling it in to make sure it doesn't like just fall out, especially on the cube parts. 
the cube, really interesting about the cube is that you can intake it from both sides. So you can take it from the top, and you can also intake it from this side. And the robot also keeps track of like which side you intake it from. Meaning, is that dependent like if it's a floor intake or like can you just you do both sides? You no can do both what. sides, but basically like if you intake from this side, but your robot is like facing that way, whenever you uh, extend the elevator, this will actually flip over. Makes sense, yeah. And that's just all stored in the state machine. And also, a really interesting thing about the intake too, programming wise, is that to sense if we've intake an object, we keep track of like the current draw. So whenever we intake, it will just spike, and that's how we know like we have an object in here. And it'll rumble to tell like the operator and driver that they have it, and they can go score it. Awesome. Well, 148, thank you so much for taking time. Tell us more about your robot machine here. Congratulations on your division win as well. I uh, can't wait to see, of course, what you do here at Chessy House, but I'm looking more forward to 2024 for y'all and see what you bring to the table. Thanks a lot. Thank you. This video on fun was brought to you by viewers like you and also by the following. Discover how you can graduate debt-free at Kettering University with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more, schedule a visit, or apply. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Most live shows can be found on the First Updates Now YouTube channel, live competitions at twitch.tv slash firstupdatesnow, and join our Discord at discord.gg slash firstupdatesnow. Check our other social offerings on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.